Coming to you from Reason Alliance Media, Episode 20, Woman in Red. I'm Miss V. Haven. And I'm Demanda Wright. And we're promoting promoting secular secular feminism. feminism. I don't think I did that as well as you usually do it. Oh, that's okay. I know. We'll live. It's opposite day. We'll trade back next time. Okay. In today's episode, we have an interview with the women from Women in Red Project. We have Feminism 101 about debating feminism. We have some patrons and some nice comments from the internet. Yay! I get all fuzzy, good Good form feelings. And we have some funny business, as you can probably tell. Nicely done. Thanks. Welcome to Educated Guests. Today, our guests are two women from the Women in Red Project on Wikipedia. We have Rosie Stevenson Goodnight and Susan Barnum. And if you would, ladies, uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves, how you got involved in the project. Uh, Let's start with Rosie. Well, hi there. So, yep, I am Rosie Stevenson Goodnight. And I'm a co-founder of Wiki Project Women in Red, which has been around for about 10 months now. And it's quite a fun story. So I'll leave that for a little bit later on of how we kind of got started. Okay. All right. And Susan? Hi, um, I'm Susan Barnum, and uh, I've been editing on Wikipedia. Well, I used to work, rather, on Wikipedia for a long time, and then I kind of stumbled into Women in Red, and I really felt like I was really welcomed there. I felt like I came home, in a way, so um, I just really like to help and support the project the best that I can. Okay, so why don't, um, Rosie, you tell, go ahead and tell us um, about how the project got started, then. All right, I'd love to. So I'm um, a prolific Wikipedia editor, editing since 2007, and I've edited in all sorts of different areas on thousands of articles, uh, something over 4,000. And, you know, if you've edited those many articles, people kind of get to know you. Um, So about a year and a half, another editor a man who goes by Victor's left a note on my talk page and the talk page of um, quite a few other editors. And he said that the international Wikipedia conference called Wikimania was coming up in July, 2015. And there was a call for presentations. And he had this idea that, um, he had an idea that we should present, that somebody should present on content gender gap. And what he meant by that was all the missing articles about women and women's works. Um, so not having anything to do with who the editor is, but just what's missing regarding women. Okay. And, okay. and so he stopped by the user pages of people who had been writing women's biographies and articles about other things women do. And that's how he stopped by my page. And what really got my attention was the name he came up for this um, possible proposal. And the name was How to Pick Up More Women. Oh, no. (laughs) That's great. So it got my attention. It got everyone else's attention who saw it. And people started responding on his talk page that that title was provocative and maybe inappropriate and definitely inappropriate and everything to how horrible. Why did you think of this? Go away. (laughs) (laughs) That would probably be my response. But I recall looking at that and thinking about it and thinking that I understood what he was trying to do and that I'd never gone to an international Wikimedia conference and I'd never spoken at an international conference. And the opportunity to maybe get a presentation accepted at something that seemed to me pretty prestigious and 
in reliance on something that I really, really love to do, editing Wikipedia, I thought maybe this maybe this idea is the right idea because it's provocative, because it'll get people thinking, it'll be the one that'll get noticed. And maybe the end justifies the means. And so I wrote a note back on his top page saying something like, you know, you got my attention with this. And I think in general, the idea is great to develop a project dedicated to writing articles about missing women and missing women's works. And I think that this is really good. But the title, you know, that's what we're going to have to, you know, maybe rethink that. And uh, you probably need a woman who's going to present with you because a man standing up there talking about this, I'm not sure how that's going to go over. And he responded right back. He said, Rosie, the door is open. You don't have to knock. Come on in. Let's do this together. Well, that this project is fascinating for me because a, a very important part of feminism is rereading or reading into history the way in which women haven't um, been accounted for in historical works and scientific um, aspects and lit- in the literary canon. And so um, for me, for this to still be happening as something that we're dealing with now in terms of our digital media literacy is particularly important. And I'm so glad that you're here to talk about it. Um, Susan, will you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the project? Um, well, I was really caught by the... Um the statistic that less than 15% of um, biographies on Wikipedia were about women. And um, that just struck me as wrong. (laughs) Wait, there's a statistic? um, You mean like we actually have (laughs) evidence for the way in which there is gender inequity in our society? Wow. Yeah, they they track it really carefully, right, Rosie? I mean, it's, it's really pretty well documented in Wikipedia, I think. At the time we wrote up the proposal, which was February 2015, it was 14 something, 14.5 percent, let's say. And so it was, you know, having that number, having that, you know, someone came up with that number and it seemed pretty accurate. It seemed like a good reason to write up a proposal. And, you know, the proposal was accepted. And here we got to go to Mexico City in July 2015 and actually talk about this and show these slides and be in this big room where people were listening to us because nobody had actually really done this before. I think, I think it's, um, Particularly important because when we, when we take on projects such as this or the project that both of you are working on, it often, like when we talk about gender inequity in society, people think that um, we're pointing fingers at someone or there's a problem or, you know, men did something wrong. And here it's not that easy. It's not that simple. There's a cultural phenomenon for some reason. As you said, there were, did you say 15% of the biographies on Wikipedia were women's biographies. So there's definitely gender inequity, but it's not about um, pointing fingers at someone who you know did something wrong. It's about redressing right, an injustice. I think that's a really good point because um, like personally me growing up, I'm in my 40s. So like growing up, I never saw women doing anything interesting. I never read any books about women doing anything interesting. And I really assumed that women didn't do interesting things in history. And um my eyes have been opened by starting to work on this project in Wikipedia, um, seeing all the different things that women have been involved in. Like I found feminists in Yemen and Libya. Uh, there's people who've been um, doing suffragist work in Texas. I mean, just all kinds of things. Like it's insane the amount of things that women have been doing. And it's so interesting. And because it's hidden, you don't know it's there. And you're you're kind of you can't be inspired by it by as a kid. Like, you know, as a kid, like I wanted to be like, you know, Frodo or someone like that, like a guy, there was no one like that for me. There was no Katniss Everdeen for me to look at. And, you know, um, yeah, I think there's, having those kinds of stories is really important. There's, there's not many women in the, uh, the Tolkien lore there, yeah. <laughs> especially totally. the Hobbit, which has none. <laughs> At all, right? I'm not joking. There are none. Go oh, check. That was like my favorite book as a kid, and, and right? you know, I just always, you know, what are you supposed to look to? And you know, um, so like writing these biographies for me, also, like I'm a mom, and 
Um, and, and I also, my kids are biracial. So uh, I think Women in Red also does a really good job of focusing on not just, you know, white women, but also women from many different cultures as well. That and um, and that's awesome. really important because yeah, there's, there's a really big bias on Wikipedia for that as well. Yeah, I imagine. So I, as a kid and uh, in, in music school, actually, I, I always found it so fascinating that there were so many works of music that nobody knew who actually wrote it because it was assumed to be a pseudonym, whoever the composer Ooh. was. And so many times they just had no idea, but they probably thought it was a woman because the pseudonym was so ridiculous. But well, there's, there's women couldn't of, get published at the time. Yeah, there's plenty but of examples of the way in which getting published now. I yeah, mean, it's crazy. The the way in which women would um, do work, you know, in tandem with the man, and the man would get the publishing credit for whatever that work was, mm-hmm. right? And we have all, we know that this happened. We have archival evidence for all of these types of things, but. This has to be rewritten, right? We have to rewrite um, that history. And what perfect place to do that than the place where we all go to learn about things every day, Wikipedia. Right. Absolutely. I had, I had a different experience. My maternal grandmother was the founder and first president of the University Women of Yugoslavia. And so I think of her as this role model. And I think... You know, I've I've kind of gone through life thinking I could never live up to somebody who's done something that seemed to me to be so fabulous. I mean, I've had a really good life and I'm a mom, too. And, you know, I have a fun job, but, you know, I've never done anything quite like I thought my grandmother was up to. And finding Wikipedia kind of seemed the answer. I had wanted to be this cultural anthropologist And when I was in university, my dad said, no, he wouldn't pay for me to study to be a cultural anthropologist. He said, you know, you're not going to be Margaret Mead. You're not going to go to Papua New Guinea and study island people. And so you should you should think of something more practical. And his examples were to become an accountant or a pharmacist. Oh, oh, no, because we're all about practical degrees here on PSF. I got told not to take French in high school because it was impractical. I was told I should take <laughs> Spanish, and I was like, I want to be a singer. What good is Spanish to a singer? Yeah. I mean, I'll sing Spanish songs, but they're very similar to French and Italian verbs. So, I have a I mean, whole bunch of English degrees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I went from music to psychology. I fine arts. I, I feel you. Yeah, we all have, okay. quote unquote, useless degrees. So, um, no, so, you, so it had to be um, accounting. And what was the other one? Or pharmacy. Or pharmacy. So, so I did what, what I think other women might have done. I dropped out of school. And then I went back to school when I was in my late 30s and got a degree in business because my employer would pay for that. And then I got an MBA again because my employer would pay for that. But this cultural anthropologist that resides in the center of my being, she would not leave. <laughs> she, she, she stayed there. And then I found Wikipedia and I did my first edit. I created an article on some books that I collect. I collect books. Um, I'm a bibliophile. And I collect books by Book League of America, a publisher that's gone now. I created that article and, you know, I can't say I was hooked that moment, but maybe I can say I was hooked. It just, it just, just resonated with me to do this. And so, yeah, so here we are today as part of this wonderful project, Women in Red, that's now in multiple languages. Um, we've created about 16, th- just over 16,000 articles in the first nine months. Wow. 16,000 articles. Congratulations. Whoa. I just got a lot of people working together. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Congratulations to all of you out there and a big thank you for all of that work. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing. And, you know, we've, we've kind of been talking about it, you know, as Sue mentioned in Berlin and then before that in Washington, DC and in Mexico city. And next month I'll be back in Washington, DC and then off to Italy, Sinolario, to talk about it 
on its one year anniversary at the next International Wikipedia Conference. Um, and what we're trying to do is to just engage more people in the work and really hope that it takes off in all the languages of the world, because this is not a unique problem to English language Wikipedia. These articles are missing in all the language Wikipedias. And if we just put somebody on translation work and they took every article on every notable woman or every book written by a notable woman and they translated it into all the languages of the world, I mean, they'd be working on this for a really long time. Wow. So. I mean, it just it just shows you the level of disparity and that even with all of this work, there's, you know, still so much to be done for there to be any sort of parity in content gender wise. Absolutely. Oh, I mean, yeah. We're now at about 16 uh, percent. Woohoo. 16 <laughs> percent. Awesome. Are about women. But I mean, we hold up 50 percent of the sky. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like that, that this is particularly like the argument I try to make over and over again on the podcast that often in our society, the, the feedback I get about feminism is the work's done. Like you have the vote and there's been legislation. You're equal. Like, what are you, like, what's your concern here that, you know, the role, the feminism is over and done with and it's had its day. And so like for me, this project is particularly evidence and an example of the way in which feminism has a very practical role in our culture today. Absolutely. And I, I often quote, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg talking about, uh, this quote that she always uh, is people refer to as saying um, like she's asked how many women need to be on the Supreme court for there to be enough. And she'll say all of them Yeah, I, <laughs> because there's totally always been an all male court. So it's like, and we always get like, you know, we're, we're doing so much better today um, with issues of gender um, equality than we were, say, in 1950. And we're supposed to be satisfied with incremental pro progress. And we For can now. celebrate the move from 14% <laughs> to 16% in this specific project. And that's wonderful. But we don't have to be satisfied with incremental progress. Until we, we reach parity, then we yeah. still have work to do. Yeah, it's so mm -hmm. great to like to hear specific statistics that say there's still work to do. And, and you guys are, are here to do it. And it's, it's amazing. So what I would really like to know is how do you get involved with this project? Oh, uh, well, you join Wikipedia. You, you sign up and you come to the wiki project and well, okay. That, that, that makes it, I think we, I wonder if we've used a lot of jargon like Wikipedia, you know, you sign up, you can create a user account and then, um, there's lots of things called wiki projects and that's what we, women in red is. So as a, once you make yourself an account, if you can navigate to Wiki Project Women in Red, which Rosie will probably be able to explain better than I am, and, and you can join, and, and editors there are very helpful and very inclusive, and there's both men and women working on the project, and from all over, I, I mean, as far as I can tell, Rosie, it seems like we have people, like, internationally, you know, working on the English project, at least, it's and, it. um yeah. So, so I, all they have to do is like kind of show up and, and say, you know, hey, I want to be involved and, and we're going to help you out. I, what, what do you think, Rosie? How would you kind of describe the process? Um, first, I went to find a link and I'm going to paste it in here so that um, you can see how to get to our project easily. Okay, we'll place that in our show notes. Yep. Once this is published, we will put it in the show notes so that everybody who listens can follow that link. I remember around December 31st um, going through the Women in Red talk page. So I've given you the link to the actual project, but the project also has a talk page. There's just a tab for it at the top. And I, I decided to count how many posts were there on our talk page. And when I got to something over 1,500 posts... I thought to myself, where would people be asking these questions or ma raising these comments or talking about these articles if we hadn't created this project? Like, what would they be doing? Would they be writing articles about 
some building or some bacteria or improving the article on a harp or the zebra. But instead, over 1,500 posts are, are here. And so people, people are interested in this. And I, I think maybe with the exception of a short exchange um, a few months ago with a gentleman who thought that um, who had some negative things to say about what we were doing. Oh, we know all about those gentlemen. We're so surprised. <laughs> all most of these posts have been positive and they're related to, hey, take a look at this article or, hey, um, why don't we do an edit-a-thon regarding women in leadership, women in science, women writers, women photographers, and so on. And it just amazed me to think that there were so many people willing and wanting to talk about this disparity, this systemic bias. And if we hadn't started this project, you know, you know, I, I'm very grateful for the idea that Victor's had, even though the name of the proposal was a little off-putting. Um, in this case, the end justified the means, because here we are today talking about women in red. Yeah, and this is... Oh, I, we didn't explain why it's... Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, we didn't say why it's called women in red, though. I don't, I don't know if a non-wiki person would, would get that. Would, um, the, um, oh, yeah. Please, please explain. Yeah. Well, um... When you're on Wikipedia, the blue links link you to another article. But if a link is red, that means the article doesn't exist. So Women in Red is about turning all the red links into blue links. Uh huh. And yeah, that's where it comes from. And then I like it because it reminds me of the poem about when I get old, I'm going to wear a red hat and purple. <laughs> it's uh -huh. a very old. <laughs> I have it, plenty it of hats happy. already. Yes, Amanda has <laughs> has a dearth of hats. <laughs> so are you? And some people think the woman in red dancing. I, I just think it's kind of evocative, you know. Don't you think, Rosie? I do, and you know, even how we got to women in red was a little funky um you know i i said we 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 launched this at a presentation in mexico city july 11th 2015 roger was skyped in and i was standing on the stage and we didn't call it women in red uh, -uh. we called this new project that we unveiled with fanfare that the name of the project was wiki project xx standing <laughs> Chromosomes. Again, Roger's idea, give credit where credit is due. And as soon as I got off the stage, I was whisked away by some journalists who wanted to interview me. So I was gone for about an hour after I left the stage. And when I was done with that, I went to rejoin my friends. And at least a couple of them were in tears. And oh, I was... No to what was this going on what was this about and I the title was I was told it's because the title is offensive to the trans population and that you know had we thought about that and I was honest saying I hadn't given that any thought and I would never want to do something to offend anyone and let's change this and that name women in red again came from victuallers as a second possibility he had had and so I just immediately kind of threw it out there like how about women in red um, referring to those red links those articles that don't exist yeah and so that seemed to be taken well and so you know two hours after the presentation we went from one name to another name mm -hmm. See, and this your your approach here is particularly instructive. That often when um, we have done something that's offensive, a lot of people take the approach that um, if I admit that I've done something offensive, then I have to feel bad or you know be conflicted about that. And instead, you were just very upfront. I hadn't thought about it, and let's change it. And that's all you really have to do to to move on to be more inclusive. And so I. I particularly um, want our listeners to take that approach in, to inclusivity. I, I also really like that it's called women in red and not like females in red. Right. Because then you're inclusive <laughs> of people who identify as women, which is great. I mean, 
that that opens up a whole new world of possibilities there. So when you're when um, you're a part of this project, have either of you noticed, you know, content areas that were um, particularly in need of um, these articles about women sort of in like certain subject areas or in certain content areas? It was the disparity um, greater in some than others, I think is my question. <laughs> Every oh, architecture one. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. The architecture one stands out for me a lot, too, though, because it was it was really bad, wasn't it? And then didn't um, one of our editors, Ipigot, he had a, um, some some statistics that showed that we had increased the amount of women architects by a ridiculous number just through the edit-a-thon that we did. Oh, that is true, Sue. And then you wrote up that article that was published in the signpost paper about it. You are so right. Yeah, we... We did something, I guess, phenomenal without knowing it with um, how many more articles we increased on Wikipedia regarding women architects. So you're right. That was a very underserved area. And our editathon um, did something amazing. You know, I forget because it was 2015. So describe <laughs> yeah, for us that. this editathon process. What's an editathon? How does that work? It sounds fun. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> well, you can do them in two different ways. You. Or, or three different ways, rather. You could do um, an on-site edit-a-thon. Like if you have a lot of people in your area that are editors, you can get them to all come together, like maybe, for example, at a museum or a library. And they'll all come together and they'll edit um, articles together in a collaborative way. Um, the way that we do it in Women in Red most often is online. So we have people from all over the world collaborating on a certain topic. And we sponsor um, different topics every month or sometimes two or three topics a month. <laughs> it's kind of, we kind of have been doing a lot. And, and or you can do a blended approach of both where you have an online edit-a-thon in conjunction with a, a local edit-a-thon. And then people just, they go to what's called a meetup page on Wikipedia. And it's very easy to find once you've joined the Wiki project. I know this probably sounds all complicated and crazy, but it's very easy because if I can do it, anyone can do it. So, um, you know, they, they join the wiki project and they'll see, you know, what's coming up as an edit-a-thon. And then they can click on the link, sign up for the meetup. If the meetup's in their local area, they can go physically to that place. Like um, there was one at your, um, in and, uh, uh, with Las Vegas with you, Rosie, and I did one in El Paso, Texas. Cool. Um, so, you know, if there's people there, they can show up and then they can learn how to edit Wikipedia if they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, we'll guide them. It's really awesome, and we give them food, you know. So the so the in house ones are awesome, but the online ones are really cool too because it gives you a chance to. I mean, for me, I've learned so much about women's history because I keep getting different topics from Women in Red. Like this month, we're doing photography, and um, we're also collaborating with. I forget who we're collaborating with, but it's with uh, Middle Eastern artists. Yes. So I, you know, yeah, and, artists and, and from the Middle up, East and North Africa. I looked on your page. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's so cool. I mean, there's like, there's art, there's women artists in Saudi Arabia, and and the only artist in Saudi Arabia that has a museum of her own is a woman. Wow. There are no men that has their own museum. So I mean, who would guess that? I mean, I would never have guessed that in a billion years, mm -hmm. and that's why I I like working on this because I'm like. When my daughter grows up, she'll have some stuff to look at, you know, and be like, "Wow, women are awesome." <laughs> right. That <laughs> you know, is so like, cool. So, are and there are there particular um, areas that um, either of you really enjoy writing about in these um, women in red articles? I, I can tell you, for me, there's a few, but the one that really stands out. So, you know, I guess it's my number one is I am fascinated by the conferences that women convened um, over a hundred years ago uh, and even in the 19th century regarding, you know, the suffragists and then the ones interested in, in international peace and so on. And, and there was no internet there, you know, there was, you know, mail and there was the telegraph and, but they found a way to communicate with each other and set dates and, you know, put together programs where women from many other countries, from many countries would come together, would spend a week together, and they would come up with these resolutions 
of whatever they would resolve. And they would plan to meet again in, you know, two years or three years in another part of the world. And, you know, it could be Montevideo or it was Geneva, but it was, you know, different places in the world. And I started reading the, you know, you can get it on um, as a G book, a Google book, these um you know, documents and, and started reading about what these women were able to accomplish. And I thought, who are these women? So it was easy to start writing articles about them. But that really fascinates me. So if I were to say what one particular area do I really like, it would be that. And I guess women writers. I'm, I'm the founder of Wiki Project Women Writers, which we did in which we started in 2014. So I figure I'm a writer. I'm a woman. I I don't have a degree in English lit, but I'm a writer. And there's a lot of other writers. And we don't know about those women writers. And I think we should figure out who they are and we should create articles about the notable ones. And so, yeah, it would be those two areas. The conferences women have convened and then women writers. I love how enthusiastic you both are about the project. And it makes like, I'm sort of, you know, it's a, it's a contagion. I'm catching the enthusiasm. And now I just want to lurk on Wikipedia and read all of these very interesting things that have never been there before. I want to gather oh, people in a totally library. Like I know. Buffy. Oh, it, it's, it, it's totally it like Buffy. Your mind. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's insane. The stuff that's out there and the stuff that hasn't been written about it just kills me. Like I, I'm a librarian and I work in a library in El Paso and we have a border heritage section. So um, I spend a lot of time working on, um, you know, people who uh, like I, I'm, I'm in an awesome El Paso and ah, I can't even talk today. I'm in an awesome Texas town, which is not something you can usually say <laughs> because <laughs> most of Texas like, is not fun. We're in North but, Carolina uh, <laughs> right now and it's not a very awesome place to be. We're first in bigotry. <laughs> Yeah, Texas is Texas is pretty close, but I live in El Paso, which is on the border of Mexico and New Mexico, and so we have this like sort of cross pollination of culture. Like, in fact, it's it's more like living in Mexico than it's like living in Texas, and there's more Mexican people here than there are anybody else, and it's so awesome. And so we have a border heritage section that talks about all these Chicano artists and these Chicano writers and, um, you know, these women who were involved with Texas suffrage. And, and it's just insane, the stuff that these people did. And it's like what Rosie was saying, like, I can't believe how progressive people were in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> and you wouldn't know that that was happening, you know, if you didn't research it. And of course, no one's talking about it. So if we weren't writing about it, it would just be invisible. Exactly. Like we have, we have narratives that the things that we all just think that we already know about women's role in history or what parts were played or how the history, um, happened. And the fact that these articles, there's so much to still write about absolutely changes all of our perspectives on the role of women in history, whether that's, you know, internationally or in El Paso. Yeah, oh, I, totally. I'm really glad that y'all are writing about women scientists in particular, because I am uh, partially in charge of getting speakers for ReasonCon 3. And I'd really like to have uh, a good half and half of uh, men to women ratio of scientists. So, of course, I've been researching women scientists, trying to find people to come speak. And I'm like, please, I need <laughs> more information. So I I'm, I'm really appreciate the effort that's going into that in particular, because I, I am very interested in it, like right now. <laughs> uh, we have two women who I should then tell you about who belong to our project. One of them who goes by the name Kailana, username Kailana, is, um, oh my gosh, she's Friday. She's graduating from um, her university today with a bachelor's degree. Oh, that's and, so awesome. Congratulations, yeah. Kailana. <laughs> and she leaves, um, in the fall to start medical school. And what's really special about what she does on Wikipedia is she is the founder of Wiki Project Women Scientists. <gasps> Should know that. And how she got her start doing that is being a young woman, she has been harassed, um, you know, through her formative years, and she found solace in Wikipedia. She felt like if she got harassed by someone, what she would do is go sit in her dorm room and write an article about a woman scientist. And now she's got... I love that so much. 
thousands of articles about women scientists because she's also rallied other women to do what she does. And so her story got picked up by all the you know, major um, news outlets in the month of March, Women's History Month, because what she does is so absolutely awesome. And it's about women scientists. And then we have another woman who goes by the username Flo Knight, as in Florence Nightingale. Ah, who's a, cool. <laughs> she's all about um, women's health. She's a nurse. Oh, women's cool. Health. So she's trying to get those articles created and improved. So we come from different kind of, you know, parts of the world and we do different things and we have different interests, but we all have found our way to this Women in Red project where we kind of, we concentrate on little niches ourselves, but every month we work on some articles that sort of fall within, like I said, leadership or architecture, science or what have you. And... Yeah, we dig it. <laughs> well, this this project is so exciting to me because often um, my my role as a feminist activist is primarily through the podcast, and I do a lot of ranting about what's wrong and you know how can we fix things, and I get really worked up about it. And here's something that we can actually do, and that's going to make a difference. Oh, yeah, anybody could help. Like even if people just come in. And um, you don't have to be a writer. You know, if you want to come in and just help us rate articles or um, or find uh, people who should be on what we call the red list, you know, where um, like if they're notable people who haven't been written about, you can find those. You can um, help us um, do wiki gnoming, which is, you know, just you don't have to be a writer. All you have to do is just be willing to help out and just, you know, be willing to sit in front of your computer and and do some coding and and um and, and and Wikipedia has gotten so much easier to edit. Like you can edit it like you're editing a Word document now. So it's like very easy. It's really easy to cite stuff. Um, you know, like I said, like I, I mean, I'm a librarian, but I'm not like the world's smartest librarian. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And um, and and any and I encourage anybody who's listening, who's even remotely interested, to you know sign up and and give it a shot because it's not hard and it's fun with us and we'll make it fun. Miss B is waving her hands in the air vigorously. Yep. I think that's her assent to be a part of the project. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm really excited about this. I'm going to go check it out because I may not have a job in a week or so. So. Uh, Oh. I'll have a lot of time on my. <laughs> this is something very constructive. <laughs> yes, too. Yeah, that's the other part about it. I feel like I'm doing something constructive and useful whenever I edit an article. So, it it does. It feels useful and 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 um and and personally, I'm an atheist myself. So for me, like finding meaning in life is like I have to create my own meaning. So, editing these articles helps me create a sense of meaning for myself as well. So that helps. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, particularly in the secular community. Um, we have. Um, you would think that once we're you know sort of um, not involved in you know traditional structures as secularists, we wouldn't have the same mm -hmm. gender inequity issues, and those issues are just replicated in the secular community. Oh yeah, and so yeah. you know. For me, that's an area that I would be particularly interested in looking at as women, you know, secularist women in the secular movement, the history of secularism and women in that movement. So I'm going to take a look at the Women in Red project. <laughs> totally. I'm and super I excited. Think, I don't think we have an article about secular women. Sue, do you think we do? Did you Have you seen something? No, like I this? haven't. The, you know, the only thing I've seen, the, I, I wrote an article about atheism in the African diaspora, but um, I had assumed there was already one about women in, um, in the secular movement. But now that you mention it, there probably isn't. <laughs> I mean, since there wasn't one for, for African-American atheists until like recently, there's probably not one for secular women either. I, I mean, it, it's it's mind blowing what there isn't, what doesn't exist. I, I mean, it it just it's not there. Yeah. There okay. <laughs> Seeing, we have a we job have a to do. <laughs> oh, oh and, and you know, that's the best part. You can collaborate on an article together, and you know, everybody can participate, and you know, pull their research together, especially on something that's a huge topic like that. You know, everybody can kind of get together and and work on it. Well, this that's, that's a big. 
This is just. I'm creating my login right now. Oh, no, Miss Be Focus. <laughs> She's, in. She's going to edit now, immediately. Right now. I am but, so bad. But that about just that. no, that just goes to no, show you. That. That's good. <laughs> you, you feel passionate about it. Like this is our feel good story of the entire podcast thus far. Yep. This is great. Uh, do you yeah. do y'all have any further questions for us or anything that you want to say to wrap up before we uh, uh, sort of end this segment? Um, I know that I want to say that Women in Red is not exclusive to women editors, that we don't give a hoot what gender you relate to. Just write the articles. Right. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we we work with anyone and everyone, and um, we need more hands. Yours are welcome. Your listeners' hands are welcome, and we would be glad to you know be there for you and and help anyone along who wants a little guidance once they get started. Um, yeah, this is a, this is the perfect example of a structural or a systemic inequality where um, we require both genders' participation in order to rectify the inequality. Yep, right, definitely. And and Wikipedia can be intimidating to get into because there are a lot of rules that people aren't aware of at first, and um, so sometimes they'll create articles and they'll get hit by those rules right away. And they'll get discouraged um, because it's it's um, it is frustrating when you create an article and all of a sudden it's marked for deletion or something or it has tags all over it like not well researched and you're like but I just started writing it you know so you know we're we're all there to help um, and a lot of us have database access to um, databases all over the world and we have people from all over the world you know who can help translate articles right libraries different links. Yeah, yeah, I it's... would particularly encourage people who are interested in, um, you know, learning research skills that this is the perfect way to get involved. Absolutely. Learning, learn what databases are, learn how to access the information, learn how to then, you know, present that information to other people. That's a necessary skill that we all need to have. And this is the perfect way to learn to yeah, do that. Learn how your research okay. papers can be applied to real life things. Yes. <laughs> My yeah, it, it students, are you it, listening? It, they're like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't listen to this. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you coming on the show to talk about this. Um, and I am already signed up, so I've got a screen name. I'm going to do this. What's, this your, so what's your screen name? My screen name is Miss Behaven, of course. Miss <laughs> Behaven. Of course. Thank you so much. We're so happy to have you. And yeah, thank uh, you for having us. I will definitely get that link on the show notes so that we can get more people involved in this because this is awesome. And also, when this does publish on uh, our website and on iTunes and all that, I will get one or both of you a link to it. It'll be on Twitter and all that stuff, too. Um, but just so that you've got the link to it, if you want to link other people to it. I would definitely, definitely want to do that. Thank you so much for having us on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank wait, you. Wait, can I say, can I, can I say the safe word? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Oh, let's do it. Oh, yay. Okay. Bananas. In pajamas. Coming down the stairs. <laughs> yay. <laughs> It's time for Feminism 101, when Princess Sparkle Fart's luminescent flashlights helps you navigate the mysterious, murky, malcontented world of man-haters. <laughs> and oh boy, am I feeling hateful today. <laughs> I recently listened to the debate between James Lindsay and Eli Bosnick on Atheistically Speaking which purportedly included their perspectives on feminism as another problematic cultural phenomenon to be debated in between trigger warnings and safe spaces. I could stop right there, and I bet you could figure out what problem I'm going to have with this debate. 
In this debate, Lindsay repeatedly compared feminism to Christianity, the purpose of which was to posit feminism as an unsubstantiated ideology, an ideology that not only cannot support its claims, but one that doesn't intend to support its claims. If you can remember our hate Miller, his position was also that feminism is about belief and emotion and can't be supported, much like Christianity. In fact, I think he made that comparison. This position that feminism is a belief similar to Christianity has quite the following in the secular community. If you're at all interested in substantiating your claims about feminism, then I suggest you educate yourself about it first. By education, I don't mean Googling or going on the Reddit to figure <laughs> all of this out. Those are fun things to do, and I do them myself. But you people in the secular community are purportedly good at research, so I'm going to hold you to those research standards on the topic of feminism, the way in which you research other topics of interest to yourselves. It amazes me how much the secular community is interested in arguing about things like the Christian Bible, and they know so much about it, and they do it so well. Yet, when they go to arguing about feminism, they do it with little knowledge about the history of feminism, feminist activism, or theoretical feminism. I mean, I guess it's just simple. It's about gender inequality or inequity or whatever. What's there to know, really? I want to talk more about the caricature of feminism Lindsay presented, but I just get really Really fucking angry and would be seen as just another angry feminist. So I'm going to try to focus on the educational aspects that we feminist, Eli Bosnick, should have as a ready understanding when we're going to be debating feminism. So when Lindsay says something ridiculous like, I don't like third wave feminist, we can figure out what he means by this. I'm briefly going to explain what feminism means to me, and then I'm going to give you a brief history of versions of feminism, of which I'll only likely get about halfway through. So I'm going to do this in parts because I like to hear myself talk just as much as Lindsay and Bosnick do. Also, P.S., if you didn't know, listening to Promoting Secular Feminism is a good way to get all that information since we've gone over much of this already. There's a podcast about it. Who knew? Yeah. Also, before I begin, my knowledge of Lindsay begins and ends with his words on atheistically speaking. So in the future, if I read his book on moral psychology or find more out out more about his background in mathematics. I'll let you know if that influences my opinion. Right now, I'm going with what I've learned um, listening to him on Atheistically Speaking. So that's the context within which I'm speaking. So here are the basics of feminism. And I'm trying a different metaphor this time. Okay. New metaphor. Okay, new metaphor. So for me, feminism is a method of reading society. And by society, I mean how we are structured and interact and culture, by which I mean the product of those interactions. So it does not imply a political position, believe it or not. Gasp. However, just because feminism is a method and not an ethics, this doesn't mean that it ethically decrees that all positions or perspectives are equally valid. Imagine that. This is one of the central disagreements most secularists have with feminism. Feminism is a product of postmodernism, makes it impossible to take an ethical stance because all ethical stances are seen as equally valid. This is the argument that most religious folks also make about postmodern ethics. We as secularists cannot ontologically ground our ethics in a deity, and we therefore have no foundation, no firm way to take an ethical stance. I personally see my ethics deriving from the way in which I balance freedom and responsibility, but that's just the way I think about it, and it has nothing to do with my vajazzle. <laughs> the fact that secularists shunt this argument onto feminists is telling for me with regards to the way gender issues are still problematic in the secular community. The fact that male secularists have solved this problem, but they think feminists haven't even thought about it, amazes me. What the fuck, people? I would imagine that I think about ethics in the way that many secularists do. And for me, feminism as a method of reading doesn't imply liberalism run amok, believe it or not. What I do with the information I garner from feminism is about my politics, not feminisms. If feminism is being practiced and watered down as a method for, as the old trope goes, giving everyone a trophy or patting each culture on the back as it continues to oppress its female constituents, then that feministing has more to do with that person's messed up value system than it does with feminism. Once I recognize inequality, my ethics require that I proceed to work against that injustice. For me, just feminism... Feministing, feminism, 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 Doctor Who's version of feminism, feminism. <laughs> 
So for me, just feministing doesn't go far enough. So it's a method of reading that I base my political positions on, but feministing in and of itself is an inquiry not a policy. And I think it's important to separate the two. My job first is to get everyone to agree that the inquiry is worthwhile. And then we can debate the policy prescriptions to address inequity. The fact that we're arguing over whether inequity exists absolutely boggles my mind. Feminism as a method of reading society and culture has two parts for me. First, feminism makes me look back and see the ways in which women have been read out of history, scientific advancements, or literary achievements. We can now find all kinds of archival evidence for women's achievements that men took credit for, or achievements that weren't respected, or qualified in the same way as men's achievements were. I don't think this is this part is very controversial. In fact, this part makes us feel like good little liberals. If they're just talking about the past, and people can't say they're a feminist because they, you know, they can say they are a feminist because they just look back at history and point out gender inequality, that it doesn't have to make them feel uncomfortable in the present. So most people, even people who don't call themselves feminist, agree with this portion of the project of feminism. And I think this is how people like Lindsay or others like Dick Twatkins can call themselves feminist in the I believe in gender equality sense, in the sense that in the past there was a problem, but there isn't anymore. So part two of feminism as a method of reading society and culture is what makes you uncomfortable. It requires looking at the society and culture that we exist in now to analyze the way gender constructs influence our interactions and our expressions. And by expressions, I mean not just what we say, but any cultural product, which I've defined as the products of social interactions. The second part for me means I need sociological and cultural information. There is a lot of evidence out there like sociologist Judith Trey cross national study presented in dividing the domestic men, women, and housework that do the kind of evidence based work we secularists really love. To claim that this work doesn't exist or hasn't been done just makes me fucking insane. There's plenty of sociological evidence for the influence of gender in our society. And if you claim that feminism isn't an evidence based approach, that patriarchy is a conspiracy theory, or that we women have no reason to be bitching, I, su- I suggest that you review some of these studies. Many of these studies have to do with issues based right here in the US. James Lindsay, during that debate, proposed that because we women are so much better off, quantifiably better off, mathematically quantifiably better off, in the U.S. than in some place like Saudi Arabia, he didn't really get the point of feminism. Oh, dear. (laughs) So any oppression I experience as a woman has to be quantifiably worse than a woman's oppression in Saudi Arabia before I get to do anything about it. Actually, I'm really grateful that I live in a society that I do. But that means that with the gender equity I have achieved or other women have worked to achieve for me, it's my responsibility to continue to work toward complete gender equality in my society and advocate for those in other societies that don't have as much equality as I do. But I don't have to stop pointing out that there's gender inequity in my society just because I should be grateful that I don't have it as bad as a woman in some place like Afghanistan. That sounds a lot like the debate about LGBT issues where ah. you go, oh, well, people get killed in some places for being an atheist or being LGBT. But it's so much better here in the U.S. doesn't mean that we don't need to fight for equality for atheists or for lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender people. Exactly Duh. right. Like this, this type of argument just appalls me. This is the type of the get to the back of the bus and wait your turn bullshit that reinforces inequity in the guise of fighting against it. It's hypocrisy run amok. This is why nobody asked me to debate. I get really emotional and angry as feminists are want to do. In debates, you have to be nice to the other person, even when they're fucking full of shit. So given the situation of the place feminism has in the secular community, I'm fucking angry as hell about it and justifiably so. Eli made a point that if we're going to be on his team, we need to be nice to Lindsay and not troll him because he was courageous for presenting these views. Don't get me wrong. I hate the entire idea of trolling, the trolling as a phenomenon, and I'm not advocating for it. But courageous for presenting these views? Really? I think here at PSF, we're more courageous for presenting a feminist perspective in the secular community than he is for presenting what amounts to the majority opinion in secularism. So you can't tell me not to be angry when someone is participating in my oppression. Fuck that too, Eli. Oh, shit. I got 
sidetracked by a rant, as I'm wont to do, and didn't even get to the type of cultural information I use as a feminist. But that would be less important to you secularists anyway, so check out all of the sociological research supporting the issues of gender inequity in our society before you say there's not any evidence. And I'll get to the history part, which I'll begin now in lieu of further man-hating. If either Lindsay or Bosnick are interested in learning more about feminism, I'm trying to be very rational. This is my rational voice. Rational I was, voice. I was a little ranty there for a minute. A minute. It probably got a little high pitched. Now, this is my rational, yeah. rational voice. Okay. Lower in tone, more calm, a little more measured. Okay. If either Lindsay or Bosnick are interested in learning more about feminism, I'll talk about an introduction to feminism. It's short, accessible, required reading to make sure you know what you are opposed to or what you're supporting. Feminism 101? What? It's the title of the segment. How appropriate. Feminism, very basically, I've argued, is a method of reading, but we often overlay our own politics onto feminism. And so you get a history of things like liberal feminism, Marxist feminism, radical feminism, on and on and on. I disagree with some of these versions, agree with only parts of others, and even the ones that I mostly align with, I'm often critical of. So when you argue that you're against third wave feminism, you should probably figure out what it is other than what you think is happening on the interwebs or at Goldsmiths in London. To do this, I would recommend reading The Rutledge Companion to Critical Theory, edited by Malpas and Wake. There's an entry in there on feminism written by Susan Heckman, which defines feminism as a way to, quote, analyze how gender is constructed and maintained as one of the central meaning structures of our society. That's, that's a feminism. She talks about the feminisms that you're familiar with, like liberal feminism. Ironically, this is the type of feminism Lindsay would probably be most aligned with. In this context, liberalism is defined as the political position that, quote, government is formed by rational, autonomous individuals for the purpose of serving these individuals' interest. Liberals argued that all citizens should participate equally in government and that all should be treated equally under the law. Nice. Here's the problem. Women have had the vote since the early 20th century, and according to liberal political theory, this should have solved the problem with gender inequality. And many, like Lindsay, are arguing that for the most part, it has. This assumption here is that if I obtain equal status under the law, I will automatically achieve equality in society at large. And I think your example, Miss B, about LGBTQ people tells us a lot about this erroneous position. Just because marriage equality has been achieved doesn't mean no one discriminates against them or that there is not more to be done politically to protect those rights. I mean, all LGBTQ people can vote. So what's the problem, Lindsay should ask in this scenario? <laughs> Conversely, there are Marxist feminists who believe that economic equality rather than political equality is the necessary condition for achieving gender parity in our society. Heckman tells us that Friedrich Engels, one of Marx's co-writers, argues in The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, that, quote, the domination of women by men arose with the advent of private property in human society. He concluded that the overthrow of private property and capitalism will result in the liberation of women. I have some Marxist leanings myself, but I don't think private property fully explains gender inequity in our society. Heckman tells us that although Marxist socialist feminism goes beyond the political, to account for societal structures influencing gender inequity. That's a good approach. It, too, is focused only on objective structures. Radical feminists, starting in about the 1970s, wanted to go beyond these economic, political, and legal structures to explain the inferior status of women in our society. Radical feminists focused on the role of reproduction to do this, and they argued, quote, that it's not the biological fact that women have children that is the cause of women's subordination, but rather the cultural construction of mothering and sexuality that defines women's status. We can agree with that. Mm -hmm. Here's another good example, however, of where I, as a feminist, am critical of a position I mostly agree with. Shulamith Firestone, an early proponent of radical feminism, thought the solution to this problem was that no woman should carry a child in their womb. Only test two babies were acceptable for her political position. This, that's a wacky policy prescription to an inquiry that I agree with. So this is exactly why I said that I think it's important to distinguish between inquiry and policy. 
So I assure you, a lot of feminists disagreed with Firestone, and there was a dialectical swing that I also often find problematic that overemphasizes the role of motherhood's importance for women's liberation. So many radical feminists today think it's not biological or structural forces, but the cultural concept of woman that helps us understand gender inequality. The radical feminist Mary Daly argues that the patriarchal structure of the Christian church has been a major factor in women's oppression. Care to disagree with that, secularist? Oh, oh, man. Like, <laughs> like we haven't said that a thousand bazillion times on uh -huh. this show. Radical feminism is now most known for the porn wars, which again, though I agree with the conclusion of the inquiry that pornography exhibits the construction of women primarily as sexual objects, I don't agree with the policy prescription that all porn should be eradicated. And we had this debate on the show. Yes, we did in the porn episode. Yes, we did. Neither did a lot of pro-sex feminists who argued that pornography was a protected free speech First Amendment issue. So there's a feminism for everyone, even free speech feminist. Yes. I am mostly that, actually. I found I'm much more go. of a libertarian feminist than, uh, than uh, politically where I lean. I'm, I'm much less libertarian in my political leanings than in my feminist leanings. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That only, however, all of that takes us only to four pages into the 11 pages Heckman uses to succinctly give you insight into the history of different kinds of feminism. Oh There's a God. lot of feminist knowledge out there. Wow. But for the purposes of this segment, I'll stop here because next up is the central influence of postmodernism. Uh <laughs> the Heckman addresses that I think I need to spend a little more time on all on its own because people like Lindsay Bogosian and even Steven Pinker really detest postmodernism and thus feminism is what they see as a branch of it. I hope this segment of Feminism 101 convinced you that there are other feminisms other than postmodern feminism, that feminism has a history prior to postmodernism with practitioners still advocating for their variety of feminism today. And that if you say something like, I don't like what feminism has become, or I don't like third wave feminism in order to be taken seriously, you should have to define your terms here. What is it exactly? Exactly that you were calling third wave feminism. Is it radical feminism, a radical postmodern feminism influenced by Lacan and Derrida? What exactly don't you like about it? What's the problem as you see it? These are the questions a good debate about feminism would address and not a sloppy one that allows someone to use the term third wave feminism without defining it. That suggests feminism is like Christianity that insinuates women don't let men speak anymore. And that's a problem that I don't know, male lives matter too, or some such bullshit while only gently correcting said person that they're creating a straw man of feminism. This wasn't a debate about feminism. It was an example of two men not knowing a lot about what they're debating. I don't need a woman to debate feminism. I need someone informed about feminism to debate about feminism. Don't get any ideas, folks. That wouldn't be me either. There are feminists out there that know a whole lot more about feminism than I do. But you didn't ask any of them, did you? The debate which jumped from safe spaces skimmed right over feminism to go to trans issues and trigger warnings didn't really address feminism at all. But it's advertised that they're debating feminism, so I'll just do that all by myself over here in a corner and I'll leave others who know more about, say, I don't know, trans issues to talk about that. And they can take Lindsay um, to task all on his own. Eli, I really do appreciate you as one of the voices advocating for social justice positions in the secular community, but you're going to have to stick to safe spaces and trigger warnings. I still love you, though, but I'm involved with Peter Bogosian right now and we're monogamous. I love you. I mean it. Okay, 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 okay. We have we have a new patron. <gasps> Wonderful. Who is it? Lizzie, I love ya. I mean it. Oh, Lizzie, bananas a day away. <laughs> Lizzie, <laughs> you're sweeter than a banana split slathered on my purple mountain's majesty. You'll get that after you listen to this game. <laughs> Thanks so much for being a patron. And if you want to support Promoting Secular Feminism, you can go to patreon.com slash promoting secular feminism and donate. And there are all sorts of cool rewards, including Lizzie is now an honorary member of the Penis Gallery, as so is Revan Reborn. So we've got two new members of the Penis Gallery. Mm. We'll have to post that somewhere. Maybe we'll get buttons or something. I love members. Mm, members. <laughs> So that was awesome, that interview. It was pretty great. I'm really excited. 
I hope you guys really enjoyed that because I am still like goosebumpy from listening to all of that cool, awesome stuff. I'm so excited about that interview. Yep. I mean, I love all our in, our educated guests, but that interview particularly has me excited to to actually be able to constructively contribute to a feminist project. I know, right? I know, I'm tingling. It was so cool. Um, yeah. So we're total fangirls now of the project and of Mega Library Girl. Yay. I'm so excited. We also have some really awesome uh, comments on iTunes, and I just wanted to thank a couple of people. Uh, first, we've got a uh, comment and a five-star review from Nowhere Chrissy that says, Thank you, Eli, in all caps, for the title. And uh, they say, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Most of them are LGBTQ and atheist shows, and almost all of them are hosted by guys. No offense, gentlemen, but this lady needs to hear things from a female perspective sometimes. I heard of this podcast from the Twitter feed of Eli Bosnick, and I'm so glad I subscribed. And we're so glad you subscribed, too, because I I really feel like a lot of people who would love this podcast are missing out. We were so, only one degree of separation away. Now we're connected. Yep. Thanks, Eli. Forever. And there was another comment on here. That from sounded very stalkery. I apologize, listener. <laughs> We stalk all of you on Facebook <laughs> and Twitter. I'm obsessed with people. <laughs> and we had another great five-star review from Amy the Heathen that said, love it on the title. And they said, I've learned a lot from this podcast and I thought I already knew everything about secular feminism. So thank you so much for the comments. And uh, if you leave us a five-star review, leave us some comments. We will definitely uh, bring them up on the show because we love to hear everything that you like and don't like about the show. So let us no, know. No, don't do hey, that. Hey, I want to know what people don't <laughs> like because I'm the one editing it. I'm sensitive. <laughs> I won't tell, no, I won't I tell to Amanda. I particularly like Amy's <laughs> comment because I'm learning so much from the podcast. I realize that sounds Me a little anachronistic because I'm, you know, I participating mean, just, in just it. Just in that interview alone, I mean, learning that there are so few biographies about women on Wikipedia. We're not going to stop talking. Like, the next five episodes are going to be talking about the Woman in Red Project on I Wikipedia. Know. It's very exciting. Oh my gosh, I want to get, like, all of them a reason con. That would be so amazing. And um, eat cookies and drink whiskey and type wiki articles. Yep. That's, that I'm now having fantasies about that. Me Thank too. You very much. Yep making snowflakes doing wikipedia i can do that so thank you so much for your participation in this uh project of ours and we're we're so happy to have feedback from y'all and uh we hope you enjoy the show My name is Muffy Bush, CEO of Mama Muffy Bush's amazing American-made Modesty Merkins. We live in terrible and tumultuous times, my friends, filled with the sinful inequities of Satan and his followers. Atheist sodomites are in our schools removing school prayer and teaching our innocent children about Muslim evolution. Liberalism is rampant. An African lizard man from the planet Beelzebub is president of the United States of America, and Matlock has languished in cancellation since 1995. These are indeed dark days, my friends. One of the more insidious effects of the secularization of this once holy nation is the sinful grooming of our lady parts. Once, our mothers and grandmothers happily allowed their hoo-ha's lady garden to flourish and blossom like a primeval European forest, full and ripe with thickets of follicle growth that rivaled the most hirsute Russian wrestlers. Our righteousness was once reflected in the glossy tangle of unsure nether fuzz, but no more. Today, the beatnik Luciferians teach women and girls that the only groovy muffin mound is one plucked clean of its holy raiment, leaving the shameful baloney folds of our devil's fun slide naked to the elements. 
in addition to stripping the holy valley orchards clean of their fruits, the worldly heathens have begun the process of ungodly pruning their forbidden hedgerows into grotesque shapes like the so-called landing strip. Well, the only aircraft you're going to be landing on that strip are from Satanic Airlines. The only godly cloven tuft is an unsheared cloven tuft. Sadly, though, due to years of feminine razor abuse, coupled with liberal GMOs and the fallout from Lizardman chemtrails, the modern woman can no longer grow the kind of subpubical rainforest that God intended. But fear not, friends. Mama Muffy Bush has the solution for your Kojacked cooch. Mama Muffy Bush's amazing American-made modesty merkins. Better than what God intended. The merkin is a pubic wig, originally worn by prostitutes who were forced to shave their horse rubs due to the infestation of lice, no doubt sent by our Lord Jesus Christ as punishment for their wicked ways. That has been transmogrified and transubstantiated into the work of God himself through my own humble muff-crafting fingers. Knitted from the finest American twine, my American-made merkins are righteously free of the silken textures of even our own glossy natural hair. Our merkins are guaranteed to be heavy, itchy, and hot prone to chafing deep rashes into your cradle of filth, better than God intended. Our merkins act as hair shirts for the crotch, securing Satan's flap trap like the seal of Solomon upon a gin-infested jar from the literary works of heathen Mohammedans. A toupee for your tinkle flower, or a wig for your whisker biscuit. However you want to think about it, we have the American-made Merkin just for you. Try out our classic, Prairie Home Companion style. A full blossom in Lutheran bush unchanged since the sounds of the mighty American beaver chewing on long shafts of hardwood echoed throughout the American Midwest. Your bush will never be so wonderfully plain Jane as it will be sporting our Prairie Home Companion Merkin. Or how about the Lady Grey? A handsome plume of silver and smoke staring up at you from your baby chute like the miniature grey-whiskered face of Father Abraham himself as he placed his only son upon the sacrificial altar to a bloodthirsty mountain god. Your devil nest will be hidden away by a full merkin. Maybe you wish to show your patriotism with the Manifest Destiny style. The red, white, and blue were never so beautiful as they are flying half-staff on your shame hole. Crocheted and dyed with my own hands and woven into a star-spangled tapestry to cover your hidey hole like the grave of the unknown soldier, you'll be so proud to salute this true American merkin. If your amber waves of grain have been harvested and your purple now needs more majesty, then fly the manifest destiny merkin up your pole and see who salutes. Do you prefer the more biblically modest crutch? Then perhaps the fig leaf style is right for you. This broad green flap of scratchy cloth is American-made to the highest standards not seen since the Council of Trent moved to condemn the excesses of the Renaissance by obliterating the unwholesome nudity of classic art. Revel in your condemnation as a daughter of Eve by sealing over your snake hole with the scripturally correct fig leaf merkin. The modesty merkin isn't just about shaming your foofy cooter but it can be used to make a proud personal statement. Such is the case with the limited edition Donald style. How better to show your support of the greatest financial wizard and billionaire tycoon and the next president of the United States of America than by this Trump-inspired Merkin. The color and texture of an unwrapped fuzzy butterscotch candy dropped into your grandmother's purse. The Donald Merkin will let you express to Lord God that you know who he wants to govern your naughty bits.
We also have amazing American-made Merkins, which recreate some of the greatest works of art in human history. Decorate your Mark of the Beast with such artistic recreations as George Washington crossing the Delaware, Whistler's Mother, the Pieta, Norman Rockwell's Thanksgiving, the portrait of Ronald Reagan, and of course, Da Vinci's The Last Supper. Cover the walls of your sin palace with the Jesus H. Christ approved conservative art Merkin series. We have hundreds of styles to choose from, with more being added every day. I believe in the Bible, the Lord Jesus, America, and in covering our collective shame from the eyes of God and ourselves as a continuous reminder that we were all made in our Lord's image, and apparently our Lord finds that image to be troubling and offensive. To that purpose, I have made this amazing American Modesty Merkins to hide that image from the all-seeing eyes of God, and most importantly, ourselves, so that along with being blissfully unaware of the nature of that irony, we can be truly ignorant of the evil ourselves. Hide your shame with Mama Muffy Bush's amazing American-made Modesty Merkins, better than God intended. Thanks for listening to PSF, Promoting Secular Feminism. You can find other episodes on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. And you can also plug our RSS feed into your favorite podcast app to access new episodes every time they come out. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash promoting secular feminism. On Twitter, we're at secular feminism. And you can find more information at our website, which is promotingsecularfeminism.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can email us at promotingsecularfeminism at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support us via Patreon, you can visit patreon.com slash promotingsecularfeminism. And we'd love to have you support us. And even if you can't support us monetarily, you could also rate and review us on iTunes, rate us on uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, all of the apps. If you can review us and rate us, we would love to hear from you. And we will also read your comments on the show. I'm Miss B. Haven, keeping the Murricans out of your Merkins. And I'm Demanda Wright, keeping the MRAs out of your VJJs. And we'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs>